Okay, we're going to take a look at the game The Lamps Are Going Out, World War I, published by Compass Games in 2016 and designed by Kirk Ullman. Okay, there's the overall board and it covers about the same ground that Paths of Glory did. It has the uh, Middle East as the other game did, uh, although it does add the East African front, which is kind of cute. There's one army here in British East Africa, another army under Leto Vertebuk, or what's his name? Vital Vorbuk? Who knows? Anyway, it's in Tanga, and uh, here you use point-to-point -point movement. There's your map and terrain key, and uh, ports. Allies can do port-to-port -port movement in the game. And these little factory symbols are just that, production areas. In the game you'll want to capture those, denying your enemy production points, and uh, which will mean he can't uh, replenish his armies. Uh, so that's a, a key part of the game, occupying territory in, in these production areas. The um, East Front, much like Paths of Glory, is a bit of a sideshow, but whoever controls it will get one point at the game. Same with East Africa, one point in the game. And um, you've got a USA Declares War track. This track will slide up and down depending on card events. And of course the Allies will want to get this US entry up to eight to get the US forces in, which is a couple of armies, I think, and another fleet. So uh, in breadth, it is grand strategy. And um, I think the game does it very well. Let's look at some other aspects of the game. Another thing I like about this game is the respect it has for the naval warfare, and in particular the U-boat campaign. That's demonstrated in the game by having two different boxes, this Hague Convention box and the unrestricted submarine warfare. Now, the Germans will get two U-boat flotillas, and at various aspects, various times in the game, the German can decide to have his U-boats attack following the rules of the Hague Convention, which will um, yield hopefully good results, get him points, sinking Allied shipping, or he can go to the unrestricted submarine warfare, which will enhance his ability to sink Allied ships, cut down on British production. But the danger of going to unrestricted submarine warfare is its effect on the United States uh, track, which is over here. If the German does go to unrestricted submarine warfare, there's a greater chance of United States entry into the war. So that's kind of a little wee subsystem too uh, in the game that I really like, which is lacking in Paths of Glory. Another aspect of the game that I like very much is its respect for the blockade and the German high seas fleet. Now the game begins with three British fleets representing the Grand Fleet and two counters representing the German high seas fleet. In the end, whoever controls the blockade box denies production points to the enemy. Now most of the time the British will be in control of the blockade with their three fleets, but if the Germans want to sally out and do naval combat, and if they're able to defeat the Grand Fleet and drive it home and gain temporary um, occupation of the blockade box, they will reduce the British Isles production points by one. So again, you have a whole little wee sub-game, almost a rock, paper, scissors thing, much like the U-boat uh, campaign over here. But it's in the game, and I like it. That's something that is missing from Paths of Glory. I think the Jutland card, the High Seas Fleet, um, is represented by just one card in Paths of Glory. So there's a decent respect for naval in this game. And there is a card event which talks about the East Asia Squadron. That's uh, when uh, the German East Asia Squadron broke out of China and caused some of the British fleet to be detached to take care of it. So depending on the um, cards in the game, you might get a situation where the German fleet can finally sally out at almost equal odds with the mm -hmm. Grand Fleet. So there's a whole little wee naval game here, um, which I think is kind of nice. Okay, the land war is fought at the army level. So each of these counters represents an army. And uh, here's an example of some of the, the counters. They're all rather generic. Each counter representing an army of a certain nationality. Great Britain here, 
Belgium, France, Italy, that's Serbia, Austria-Hungary, Turkey, Germany, and Bulgaria. And I know the Russians are in there. I don't think I have a Russian unit here. Of course, we've got the USA, if they do come in. And where is a Russian unit? Over here. So those are the basic fighting formations of the game. And um, there's either a fresh side or a spent side. The combat, as you'll see, is quite simple. But the way the game mechanics work, it really represents World War I combat on a strategic level. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. That's just the counters. I'll show you some of the other um, information counters that are kind of kind of cool. Okay, another neat thing about this game is the way the cards work. Like I said, it's a card-assisted game. So during the course of play, let's say for example, the British, or rather the Central Powers, drew this heavy artillery unit. Then he would be able to place this German heavy artillery unit with any uh, army on the board. And in the combat phase, he would have an enhanced uh, combat. Example, it says here, roll two dice when attacking, flip to the fired side, like that, to show you've used it once. And then in the appropriate phase, you'd flip it back to show it can be used again. As another example, let's say the um, you had drawn the aerial reconnaissance card. You would then you'd be able to put a tactical air superiority card or a marker on the board. I want to use a German one here, and um, it would give you an advantage in combat too. Roll one die in dogfights. We'll get to that later. Defender wins the first combat, the results in a tie, and again you flip to the flown side, and in the appropriate phase, you'd uh, flip it back to show it can be used again. So the cards modify and bring on to the board other counters, which then in turn enhance the combat. It's a simple but really elegant system. We'll get to more details on the cards later. Right now we'll just concentrate still on the board and the counters. Okay, the movement system is elegantly simple. In your turn, you can virtually only move two armies. It doesn't sound like a lot, but on this game, movement of two armies can be quite a big deal. They can move as far as they want. No movement points, no numbers on the counters. It's quite simple. As far as they want in friendly areas. Thus, if you have two armies here in Posen, the Eighth Army would have no trouble moving down here to Bavaria. So movement is simple. Now, you don't really move into enemy territory, you must fight for it. So for example, if the Germans had three armies here in Hanover, and we have a Great Britain army, the Belgian army, and another Great Britain army here in Belgium. To get into Belgium, you'd have to fight for it. And that's where the combat system comes in. It's elegantly simple, but the way it works with the phasing, it's really, really World War I-like. Here's how combat works. Okay, I'm going to show a simple combat with no modifiers. The attacker simply states what army he's attacking with. In this case, we'll say the 11th army is attacking. The defender then states which army is defending. In this case, we'll have the British uh, use their fourth army. Each will roll a die. I'll use a gray die for the German roll, and I'll use a blue die for the British. Higher is better. So we roll the die. There's our result. Six is higher than four. The Germans win the combat. So you cause the British army to be spent. However, the attacking army is always spent. And you go, well, um, how does that work? Well, just follow through and you'll see how it goes. The German then could say, well, I'm going to attack with the fourth army. So he does. The British, though, must now defend with a fresh army. You can't defend with a spent army when you already have a fresh one. So we'll have the fourth army versus the second army. Roll the die. The British get a five. The Germans get a one. So the Germans are repulsed here. They are spent because they were the attacker anyway, but the second army is not spent. Now we have our last attack. The 17th army will have to take on either the second or the Belgian. Well, the Great Britain player decides to have the same army fight. So roll the die. British roll a three. 
Germans roll a five. So, 17th Army is spent because it's the attacker, and so is the second army. But because all of the German units are spent, there can no longer be any attacking. Therefore, the British and Belgians have held off the German army uh, from taking Belgium. But this simple system has so many combinations of spent, unspent, uh, how many counters you have, when do you spend production points to revive the army, all this makes a difference. And it looks ridiculously simple, but it is very, very elegant. I'll just show you an example of combat with entrenchments, for example, which happens a little bit later in the war. Okay, let's do that same attack again, only this time we have the British entrenched. So the, the difference with entrenchments is you have to breach the trenches before you can get to the armies. So we'll have the German 11th Army uh, attack, and the Western uh, allies will defend. Same procedure, you roll a die. Germans roll a two, and the British roll a one, which means the trenches are breached. Now, when you attack trenches and are successful, the attacking army is not spent. Now you can go to the second wave of attacks if you wish. The 11th army will attack, and the 4th army will defend. You roll a die, British roll a one, Germans roll a six, 11th army is expended because it's the attacker, and so is this army, and so on until the attack is over. But, uh, well, for the sake of the video, we might as, might as well finish the attack. We'll have the 4th army, and the 1st army will defend the Belgians. Roll the die, Germans roll a five, Belgians roll a two, the Germans win again. They're spent, and um, so are the Belgians. And we have the 17th Army attack the last uh, British Army. The Germans win again, but again, they're spent, and so is Great Britain. And that's the end of the attack. Why? Because the Germans have no more fresh units to exploit the victory. Now, let's say for the sake of argument, they had one more, one more army. They would still be able to attack, again, the... Allied player would pick a unit to defend, we'll say it takes the Belgians. Now this last attack is critical, because it's going to determine whether the uh, British and Belgian are driven out. We roll a die, the Germans roll a six again, the uh, British roll a three. So the Germans win the combat, this guy is still spent. But because all of the defending units are spent, and they're defeated, they have to retreat. And in this case, they'll retreat into the Somme and the entrenchment is lost, and the Germans must advance with at least one unit, the, the unit that won the last battle, and they can uh, advance with more, which they will. They go in with four spent units. Now, what's the big deal about production and the phasing? Well, after combat comes the production phase, and the Germans normally have about, let's see if we check the chart, you normally have 12 production points, and it costs one production point to revive an army. So with the expenditure of four production points, they'd be able to freshen up these four armies. And that's generally how a turn would go for one side. Now, in the next turn, the British player, you do move, combat, and then you do production. So these units will not be able to attack. And it's this ebb and flow, seesaw effect of attacks, repulses, using production points that makes this game come alive. It's a simple system, but it's a very effective system, and it certainly does reproduce World War I combat at the army level. Now, the example of combat that I just showed you is a very simple one, but depending on the cards you get and how you play them and how many men you have in an area, there's all kinds of different combat results that can occur. Like if the Germans had heavy artillery in that battle, their first attack would have been much better. If the uh, British had tactical air superiority, they'd be able to modify that result. And another little neat thing is if you win on the first round, you've got this um, what they call big push counter, which uh, helps you uh, 
win even further battles. Now there's the big push counter. So if you win your first battle, you're allowed to put this counter on, which gives you a plus one in the next combat. So once you get rolling, um, it gets pretty, pretty neat. Now once you're repulsed, you take this big push marker off. So there's a lot more to combat that I can show in this short video. But uh, rest assured, if you read the rules and get familiar with some of the procedures, there's, uh, there's a lot, there's more to this game than meets the eye, put it that way. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, event card decks. Now, as I mentioned, there's four of these. And for the purposes of the video, I'll mainly concentrate on showing you the German deck. But what I state for the German deck is equally true of all the other decks. Most card-driven games, you start with one large deck. Many of the games, let's say designed by Mark Herman, like um, well, Washington's War uh, for the People, begin with one deck and you draw from the top and away you go. Um, the advantage of that procedure is you get quite a random result. The disadvantage of that system is that some events can really come out of turn. Um, let's say it's you're playing for the people, a Civil War game, and your first card drawn is draft rights in New York. Well, that would be quite impossible in 1861 when there was no uh, draft, and there certainly would have been draft rights in New York, that kind of thing. But it does make for a very open game. Other games script their decks uh, more, um, and this is no different. And I think scripting works for this game very good. So when you uh, get your event cards, you don't just shuffle them all into one deck like I did when I uh, did my practice game. You actually divide the uh, counters into their years. So for example, you'll take these 1917 cards, you'll take out the 1918, 1916, 1915 cards. And what you're going to do is you're going to set them aside. Because all you're going to use is the 1914 deck in 1914, which in 1914 is ludicrously small. There's only three cards. Of course, you'll shuffle them. And um, when you draw your first card, that'll be your event. In this case, the Hindenburg Ludendorff team. Roll one extra combat die for up to two German attacks this turn from either Prussia or Posen, but not both. There'll be a year symbol here and the result in the game. For example, here's another one, East Asia Squadron, that's a good one, placed near the British Isles, and this removes one British squadron temporarily from the Northern Blockade, which certainly can help you in the game. And here's another one, uh, First Line Formations. That's a good one, because it gives you a little wee counter that you put on the board, uh, which says First Line Formations, and it gives you an advantage in combat, plus two. So, as I mentioned before, the drawing of these cards usually causes units, special units, to be brought on the board, which enhance the uh, game. And, uh, like I said, the Western Allies, Eastern Allies, Central Allies, all have the same thing. Their cards are coded for the year, and you sort them into the year first. So as the game progresses, it gets more rougher, and it becomes more World War I-like. It's very well done that way. Let's take a look at the sequence of play. Okay, you get some very nicely designed player aid cards. You get a Central Powers card, a Triple Entente card, and they give you a spare set too. Why? Because the other side has the setup for each side. So they didn't, um, they weren't chintzy on the cards. They're nice quality paper, and uh, the setup is a breeze. It's real easy, and there's a mine of information here. Now, word of caution, when we played... Um, you have to watch out for something. Now, the Triple Entente player card, sequence of play is similar, very similar, but not exactly the same. Why? Because certain events happen in the other player's turn that you have to watch out for. For example, uh, on the Triple Entente card, it says here, Resolve Naval Combat, Western Allies only, even though this is the Triple Entente player card. There's events that only the other side does, so you have to watch for that when you're playing. For example, I think there's one here, the U-boat one. Yeah, on the Triple Entente player card, which is the Allies, it's, there's a face here, Resolve U-boat attacks. Of course, those are German. 
So those U-boat attacks are done in the triple entente player's turn, while in the central power's turn, the U-boat attrition is done in his phase. So when you're playing the game, watch your sequence of play very, very carefully. Here's a little quick reference here, cards, and some information. Uh, there's your U-boat attack table, and that's your list of production points. Remember I mentioned those in the game that the production points are on the board. Posen would give you three production points, Prussia would give you one, and here they give you the totals, so you don't have to add them up every time. And uh, what you want to do is reduce the enemy's production points and gain some of your own. We'll take a look now at the technology cards. Okay, each side gets its technology cards, the Central Powers and the Triple Entente. Let's just take a look at some of the Central Powers cards. And uh, they're kind of neat. Okay, heavy artillery brought into play. Aerial reconnaissance. Staustropen, uh, uh, stormtroopers. Plan barrages. Fire control, U-boats and stuff like that. Commerce rating, counter battery, so on. Now, I'll show you how these cards work because if they're not drawn in the proper order, they can't technically be used. Okay, the technology cards are all uh, coded in the upper left here with a letter and a number. And you can't use the card unless you have the uh, letter number combination already pulled. Example, it's your turn and you pull the A2 Plan Barrages card. You go, yeah, Plan Barrages, cool, man. But you don't have the Heavy Artillery card. Well, you have to discard the Plan Barrage, because you can't have Plan Barrages until you have Heavy Artillery. So you discard that card, and hopefully you get the A1 Heavy Artillery later on in your hand. By the way, when you do draw from the Technology deck, you always reshuffle. You want to draw a Technology card, you always reshuffle. This keeps the technology always fresh and moving and hopefully you'll get that A1 card. Let's just do another example draw. It's your first card, you draw P2. Nope, synchronized machine guns. So you'd have to have the P1 card, which is what? Ah, yeah, aerial reconnaissance first. So, um, that's no big deal. I've seen some people make some house rules because, as usual, gamers want everything. They want to do everything, so they say, well, just draw another card right away. Uh, the rules don't say that. You have to discard and wait till your next round. Uh, now the triple and taunt have the same uh, idea. They've got cards with letter number combinations, aerial reconnaissance. They get tanks. The Germans didn't really have tanks in World War One. Synchronized machine guns. Oh yeah, anti-submarine warfare. Cool. Royal Air Force created. Plan barrages. Poison gas. That's a interesting card and has special uh, rules just for that. Uh, oh, that's out of sequence. And uh, heavy artillery, counter battery, Q ships. Anyway, th th there's a mine of information in this game in the cards and it's got a real good World War I feel to it. Um, I didn't mention much about the US day, uh, USA uh, Declaration of War. You get this little marker that slides up and down this this track it starts in the zero, and when you get up to the eight, the chance of, uh, the USA may enter the fray with their army units and navy. Uh, they bring one navy unit to it, too. Of course, depending on the unrestricted submarine warfare, die rules, cards, the USA may get in earlier, may get in late, maybe they won't get in at all. So, how do you win the game? Well, it is World War One, So, they do have a knockout blow rule whereby if the uh, Allies capture Berlin and hold it, that's the knockout blow. They'll win the game. And uh, I played a game the other day with my friend, and I took Paris, uh, held it, and then I got the knockout blow. So if you lose Paris for the Western Allies, game's over. Lose Berlin for the Germans, game over. The other way to win is by strict points at the end of the fall of 1918. Um, various points are scored for capturing areas and um, say holding the Middle East, Basra, Sinai, um, and of course East Africa there. And you have to have a seven point lead to uh, uh, win the game. I won't say too much more about the lamps are going out 
it's a very good game. I think a half decent simulation. And um, I like it as much as Paths of Glory, strangely enough. Paths of Glory may be more complicated, more detailed, but this one is just as uh, much fun. My last comment on the game uh, is kind of interesting. Because it's a simple game, when we started playing it, we said, oh, well, this you know, looks like an, an evening game, play it in a couple of hours. No, this is a long game. We played for three or four hours and got to, I think, 1916. So I think it's going to take at least two good sessions to finish a game. Um, I'm not sure if in the notes they state how long the game takes, but I'm going to say six hours, maybe minimum, to play it. There's a lot going on in this game, and it's a bit more complicated than you think. One thing I like about it, though, is the complication is in the strategy, not in the playing of the game. As much as I like Paths of Glory, I'm always diving for the rules to find some obscure rule buried in some paragraph about something I can or cannot do. This one is easy enough that I can, I can just concentrate on pure strategy um, and just enjoy the game. So, um, very well done, Kirk Allman and Compass. I highly recommend The Lamps Are Going Out, World War One. Thank you for watching.